So hello everyone, I'm Karina Viani. I work in Sao Paulo in Brazil as a clinical research dietitian. And I've had a lot of experience in the bone marrow transplant unit as well. Um, and I also work with IPAN in, um, as a regional clinical research manager for South America. Um, so today we're going to talk about graft versus host disease uh, in children known as uh, GVHD. And so this, I'm going to go through it quickly because I imagine if you're watching this lecture, you already know a little bit about uh, what GVHD is. But basically when you have a um, hematopoietic stem cell, stem cell transplant, um, you get uh, your graft will be the the stem cells of, of the, the donor. And those cells can have an immune reaction to uh, your body, pretty much anywhere in your body, but basically mostly uh, acutely skin, liver, and gastrointestinal uh, tract. And that can be those uh, donor cells. They are the donor's immune cells. They can recognize your cells as strangers and they start to attack. So that is, um, oh, I can't change my slides. Oh, well, let me try again. Yeah, I can. Uh, sorry, so I changed twice. Okay, so um, the GVHD is divided by organ system and uh, classified as stages uh, zero through four. Uh, we have mainly for the acute uh, GVHD that happens uh, earlier in the, in the transplant process, it's ma mainly skin, uh, which you classify the stage by as uh, the degree of rash, uh, mac maculopapular rash that the patient's going to have. Uh, liver, classified by bilirubin, and the gastrointestinal uh, GVHD is classified by stool output, output per day. So these are the, the classifications from degree zero, which would be no uh, GVHD, up to a degree four, that is a very severe disease uh, causing, apart from diarrhea, uh, severe abdominal pain um, in a bloody stool. And I apologize for the next picture, but I think it illustrates very well um, what a GVHD, a severe GVHD a stool output can look like. So a lot of blood. Uh, this is uh, from a patient that had stage four gut GVHD. And you can see um, the, the skin, right? The intestinal mucosa also um, in there showing how very severe this is. And this is, uh, these are pictures from colonoscopies. And the second picture here, picture D, you can see uh, an advanced acute GVHD of the intestine and how fragile and how uh, compromised that mucosa is, even with points of necrosis. So we know that uh, gastrointestinal GVHD can through several different pathways impact on the patient's quality of life, uh, vitamins and minerals deficiency, uh, malnutrition, of course, you can imagine how uh, little that uh, severely compromised intestine actually can absorb any nutrients. And that is um, a very, very severe condition uh, nutritionally. That's why it's important for us to, to discuss it. And I brought some uh, literature just um, relating nutritional factors with GVHD. And then more by, uh, for, uh, uh, at the end of the lecture, we're gonna talk about uh, diet. So here is a, a paper that looked at nutritional status of the patients in, in relation to acute uh, GVHD and early mortality. And they saw, they classified nutritional risk by albumin and weight loss and low BMI. And they had two classifications of BMI lower than the 25th percentile or 5th percentile. And they saw that um, 
patients who were at risk, at, at nutrition risk at the beginning of the transplant process, so at the first 30 days, had a three to four fold risk of developing uh, severe acute GVHD in the following days, uh, even when they adjusted for sex, uh, age, donor source, and degree of, of matching. Um, and even the mortality, they also saw um, an increased risk for patients that were a nutrition risk too. So this is very important for us to, to realize um, the nutritional status that the patient uh, arrives for transplant is very important as uh, a risk for the development of GVHD. Um, and these uh, next uh, two studies uh, looked at uh, the outcomes uh, regarding uh, several different outcomes, including GVHD, uh, but comparing patients that used enteral nutrition versus patients that used parenteral nutrition. Um, and they saw that patients were, that were on enteral nutrition had uh, less uh, acute GVHD of the gut. Um, overall and of the gut, but not specifically for skin or, or liver in, in this study. And this uh, is very important and seen in other studies as well, um, that if adults and in children too, that when you compare to patients who were using parental nutritional, uh, nutrition alone, uh, apparently, the, you can see that enteral nutrition can lower the risk of developing GVHD and decrease uh, uh, also its, its severity. So when you look at staging. And this uh, it's theorized that um, you, when you have parental nutritional, uh, nutrition alone, you don't have any nutrients going through the gastrointestinal tract. And that is... Um, that just makes the, the intestinal barrier uh, weaker. So when you have some enteral nutrition uh, going through that, that is the, the theory that you can uh, preserve that mucosa better. Um, I've also seen um, a study looking at vitamin A uh, levels and also finding um, a different in the incidence of uh, gastrointestinal GVHD for so patients who uh, were below the median of, of the study had more GVHD than patients who were above the vitamin A median. So that's also uh, something that we can keep in mind. There are some studies with vitamin D as well. And I think uh, mostly what we've been talking about recently is the gut um, microbiota. So we can see an illustration in this, in this paper that uh, patients, uh, when they start the conditioning process for, for transplant, the microbiota reduces uh, the variety, the abundance, the variety, and the quantity as well of the, our gut microbiota. And that uh, only fully recovers uh, around after a year of transplant. Uh, so this is a very important information for us to, to have. And we realize that um, not just the, this whole impact of the transplant itself and the inflammation on, on the body, but also the use of antibiotics because patients get um, infections during that period. So that also comp can compromise our gut microbiota. And that's been uh, studied more and more uh, recently. This is one of the studies that looked at the abundance of a specific uh, uh, bacteria in the gut microbiota. And they saw that even pre-transplant, the patients who later developed acute GVHD, they had a, a lower abundance of uh, this bacteria than the patients who didn't develop uh, acute GVHD, and that was uh, statistically significant. So this um, makes us think about how maybe a probiotic therapy pre-transplant can actually maybe uh, be a prophylaxis for acute GVHD 
uh, in the future. So mainly by maintaining that epithelial barrier in, in the, the local beneficial microbiota in the intestine. So that's the uh, big hypothesis that started to, to get tested. Um, in 2015, uh, Dr. Elena Ladas, who is part of this uh, group, the nutrition group, uh, published a study of uh, safety and fe feasibility of the use of lactobacillus plantarum in uh, 30 kids going through um, HSCT uh, to a transplant. And they gave uh, the probiotic from uh, conditioning up to day plus 14 of the transplant. And um, they, this was a safety study and that's, uh, they accomplished uh, their goals. So no patient had any, any problems. Uh, and so just rendering this, um, this bacteria safe for, for those patients to intake. And um, they looked that 70% uh, of patients uh, didn't have uh, acute GVHD. And the 30% that did have GVHD, none of them had a stage four. And seven of them were gastrointestinal tract. Uh, three of them stage one and four stage three. So that is uh, interesting information. And now through the children's oncology group, they are looking at, at a, a phase three study, actually testing lactobacillus plantarum in preventing um, acute GVHD in children undergoing transplant. This is very exciting. Can't wait to read the, the results. Um, apparently, they currently have 173 patients in this study. And as I've seen on clinical trials, they have stopped recruiting. So we might see these results uh, in the near future. But this is also very important. When we talk about probiotics, that can be uh, several different types of bacteria or an association of different bacteria. It's, it's very, it's an infinite, infinite amount of, of combinations that you can use for patients apart from dosing, et cetera. Um, and this is the example of a study that uh, tried to do that, uh, test this probiotic um, to prevent acute GVHD. It was Lactobacillus haminosus, a GG, and they actually terminated the study uh, in the interim analysis because it did, didn't detect uh, a probi probiotic related change in the gut microbiome and uh, in the incidence of acute GVHD. So um, it's a, a long road ahead testing probiotics because you have to test different things, different doses, different uh, strains of bacteria to see what can be actual, actually beneficial for the patients. But it's, it looks very promising. Another thing that's been uh, recently been talked about is a fecal transplantation uh, in this acute GVHD context. So that would be a transfer of the microbiota, the fecal microbiota, and that could possibly help regenerate the, the gastrointestinal tract. So there have been some successful studies in adults. Um, this is one study looking at a patients who had steroid refractory acute GVHD um, and three quarters of the, the patients responded after 28 days of the, the first infusion and allowing for a, a big reduction in glucocorticoid dose. So that's a very interesting uh, results that can, can also be something that may be used more in, in the future for the prophylaxis or for treatment of acute GVHD. Um, and another thing that's being discussed is the use of antibiotics during uh, a hematopoietic stem cell transplant, because, uh, I, and I've seen this here working here, uh, in the beginning, there were a lot of prophylactics of antibiotics and with when the years went by, they started uh, reducing a little bit those prophylactics. So that's being discussed a lot in the literature, um, how much prophylactics to give um, and which drugs 
uh, can impact less the, the microbiota. So that's also something that could be um, dis more discussed and, and changed in the future to protect the gut microbiota. And this is a very recent um, review just talking about expanding uh, to pediatrics uh, the fecal microbiota transplantations for uh, acute GVHD. Uh, that's been uh, done in, in more in adults. And the studies in, that have been published in pediatric cases, they uh, have small cohorts so far. But from those studies, those few studies, it appears that a fecal microbiota transplantation uh, for uh, our kids might be similar to or even potentially better than uh, the adults um, the transplants that have been done in, in terms of safety. Uh, it looks very promising and this uh, review uh, updates what is published so far and talks about uh, a need for children's hospitals to start testing this in, in multi-center trials for the, the children as well. And I think that can be something that uh, will be impact a lot the prophylaxis and, and the, the treatment of acute GVHD. Um, there are studies also discussing immunonutrition. Uh, this is a meta-analysis that looked at 10 studies that use um, immunonutrients, recognized as immunonutrients. Um, it, it's a problem because of those 10 studies, they are different nutrients that were uh, studied. So five of them are glutamine, and there's a study on essential fatty acids, and acetylcysteine and selenium. Uh, but overall, when they looked at all those studies together, they saw a 19% reduction in the incidence of GVHD. Um, that's, it's a little hard to tell what exactly is working better, uh, but when they looked at glutamine versus the other immunonutrients, they uh, didn't see a difference for a GVHD. So um, some, some of the other nutrients might be uh, having more of an impact and that uh, needs also more studies for us to maybe have some nutrients that we can give patients in the future to prevent GVHD. This is a, a recent review uh, talking about GVHD where they just hypothesize about some nutrients that can uh, be beneficial or can have a negative impact on uh, the acute GVHD. Um, so they, they suggest that uh, enteral nutrition, uh, some amino acids and prebiotics can be beneficial while uh, the use of parental nutritional, nutrition alone or choline and lactose can, be, um, can have negative impacts um, on this on this condition. So just as a suggestion of uh, something that should be, should be studied, that maybe we, we should adapt uh, patients' diets in the future. And now talking about um, GVHD of the gut and the diet for those patients, uh, we, there, there are several references that we, we have that we can base our, our dietetic um, decisions. So when uh, we started doing transplants here, we looked a lot to uh, the St. Jude Children's Research Hospital orientations and the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance ones. Um, and mainly we saw that this diet should have a limited amount of fat, fiber, lactose, acidic foods, and any irritants to the gastrointestinal tracts. Uh, and the foods should be reintroduced gradually and in a stepwise manner, observing the patient's tolerance. So the meals should be more frequent and uh, small in quantities. And you should add one new food at a time every three to four hours, especially when it's a patient that has, uh, that has had a more of a severe uh, disease. Uh, if it was stage one or two, we usually go a little faster, but for stages three and four, we reintroduce those foods 
very slowly and a new food at a time every three to four hours. And if the symptoms get worse when they, or if they come back after they gotten better, uh, we go back in that diet and we can trace better uh, what food and what, uh, what diet change that, that didn't really go very well. And then we can go back. So usually um, you have four phases of this diet. Um, this is the, in the St. Jude website, you can have access to each of the four uh, phases of diets with uh, guidance and which uh, beverages and, and foods that you can, you can in consume. Uh, it's, very, it's very useful and um, I think mainly for, for patients and healthcare professionals to, to look at. And I wanted to show you what we are using uh, here in Brazil. So in um, a couple of years ago, uh, we wrote a Brazilian nutritional consensus in uh, stem cell transplantations for children and adolescents. It was a very big task from um, dietitians and physicians um, from and other healthcare professionals from all uh, over the country that had experience in this area. And one of the things that we did was to uh, standardize that uh, GVHD diet for a good GVHD diet. And we based it mainly on the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance protocol. Um, and this is the, the table of what we have been using in the country. It's a five phase diet. Well, the first phase being uh, bowel rest and parental nutrition only when patients have a very severe uh, acute GVHD. But then uh, when diarrhea volume uh, decreases to less than 500 ml per day, uh, then we can, and, and the patients don't, don't have a lot of abdominal pain, then we start to introduce uh, the first phase of the diet. Um, and we have uh, in that phase, more of a low residue lactose free diet, low acid, low oral, uh, low fat oral liquid diet. So this is mainly uh, liquids in the, the first uh, oral diet that we introduce in the second phase. And then as the symptoms are getting better and the, the patients doesn't have, don't have uh, uh, abdominal pain anymore, the, the stools haven't gotten worse. Then we progress to the third phase. Um, then we would be more, you can introduce some uh, solid foods, but we still maintain low residue, lactose-free, low fat and low acid diet. <clears throat> In the fourth phase, we go to a low fiber, lactose-free, low acid, non-irritating, low fat foods, according to the patient tolerance. And then the fifth phase would be the introduction of a, a regular, more of a regular diet, uh, slowly. Uh, we go with a gradual introduction according to the patient's tolerance. So one food at a time, uh, very slowly. And then we, we just go back to a, a regular diet with fiber, with lactose and high fed foods. Something that I wanted to, to bring to when talking about GVHD, and sometimes we forget about this because it's less frequent for us to see, is a, an oral GVHD, so of the tongue in the oral cavity. And that can be a huge impact for nutrition as well. Um, so this is a, a paper that uh, discusses this, and it's mainly it's a chronic uh, GVHD, so it's something that the patient can go through for a long period of time, and um, so mainly you, the patients get in, increased sensitivity to some foods, and you have to avoid eating uh, spicy, acidic, and, or very hard foods can be hard for the patients to, to eat as well. Um, this is uh, maybe a little outdated, but I couldn't find an updated version of this, but it, it's um, a state-of-the-art paper with recommendations for acute GVHD patients. Um, and we've been uh, using this paper to guide us in our, our daily decisions with patients here. 
Um, so it, it can be very useful, especially for the recommendations of protein. So they recommend at least 1.5 to uh, uh, grams of uh, per kilogram per day of, of protein, or even more for patients with protein losing enteropathy and an adequate amount of, of energy. They also uh, reinforce this uh, recommendation of starting oral foods only when diarrhea is less than uh, 500 ml per day. Um, otherwise, you recommend a TPN and they recommend the, the uh, supplementation of vitamin D and calcium for patients who are deficient to minimize bone demineralization due to chronic steroid use. So I think the main points um, for discussion uh, that we can talk about and that we can take from all of this, uh, I think they are a few. Uh, first, talking about nutritional status, I think it's important uh, that pre-transplant nutritional status is very important. So whenever possible, if you can have a nutrition recovery plan, if you can start seeing those patients before they go to the uh, bone marrow transplant unit, that is ideal. That's something that we've been working with our uh, medical team here. Because uh, sometimes we just, a patient comes to our institution just for the transplant and they arrive very close to admission. So there's nothing really that we can work on on that area, but uh, some patients we know um, are, they have plans for a transplant as soon as possible. So in, in a month or in two months, and then the nutrition team starts seeing those patients uh, more frequently and giving supplements so we can have uh, a good nutritional status when they start the, the transplant process. Uh, that's something that I think whenever possible is, is very important for uh, hospitals that have a BNT unit. Um, something else that seems very well established is to maintain an oral or intro diet uh, during HSCT whenever possible. Uh, so avoid uh, long periods of nothing uh, going through the gastrointestinal tract. We know sometimes we can only use parental nutrition, but we have to try to avoid that or use a maybe a little bit of ventral diet whenever possible just to keep the integrity of the intestines. For the oral diet, uh, we have to start when, only when diarrhea is less than 500 ml per day. And we, we also looked at um, when it's a smaller child, maybe you, it can be a little different. So to classify the stages of uh, gut GVHD for children, um, apart from that 500 value, they have the value of 10 ml per kilogram per day. So that can be helpful for babies or for very small children. Uh, we use that reversely too. We use that to introduce uh, the diet. So that can also be a, a good reference for us for smaller kids. And that diet has to be in stages with a gradual progression. I think the immunonutrition or those, uh, the discussion on other nutrients, specific nutrients, uh, can be something uh, fruitful in, in the future. Uh, I don't think we have much now to do any recommendations, but it's something that's important to keep studying. And maybe in the future, we can have some specific nutrients that we can give or we can restrict from the kids' diets to be able to uh, improve uh, GVHD outcome. And the future, I think, is going to be mainly uh, the microbiota. Uh, so I don't know if the supplementation with probiotics is going to be that successful. Um, hopefully it will, because it's something that it, it can be easily done. Um, but as I said, there are different kinds of supplements that you have to, uh, to study. And I think the fecal uh, microbiota transplantation can have a, a big role in the future in the treatment, mainly the treatment but also for prophylaxis of uh, acute GVHD as well. I don't know um, what's gonna come of these studies, but I think it's gonna be, it seems very promising. 
So this is pretty much what I had uh, to discuss. And I wanted to ask if anyone who's online has any questions or comments or how, how does it work in your institutions if you have a, a BMT unit and experience with this? Um, Karina, um, I just want to ask, in, in, until we know for sure that the probiotics can maybe make a difference, is there anything that you know that the low middle income country maybe have available that we can give extra to prevent um, the gravis as host? Um, and number two, do you put a nasal gastric tube in for all your patients going for a transplant or not? Yeah, so for the first question, that, that's a hard one because we, we see some case reports uh, published on patients that have translocation of probiotics. So it's, it's a little scary to, to use right now. Here we don't use our national consensus. We don't recommend the use of probiotics so far. Um, even foods that might contain probiotics, we've seen even here patients that translocated a probiotic from a yogurt. So until we know what's safe, we are a little scared of, of giving something. I don't know if there are, are actual studies with more patients um, on this, on yogurts and stuff like that. But here we, we are kind of scared of using it. But what we do use is prebiotics. And that's something that's uh, safe that I think you can uh, while we don't have more information on safety and which strains to use, maybe you can use uh, prebiotics, so some fibers or something that you, you know uh, can help those uh, beneficial uh, bacteria in our guts. So that's something that we, we do here. Um, and as the, the second question for the feeding tube, yeah, we put on a feeding tube for all patients because we've had the experience of uh, maybe waiting a little bit to see if they eat and no patient uh, could uh, eat well during the whole transplant process and they started losing weight. Um, it could be also a problem with uh, uh, the hospital diet. We don't have a lot of options for those patients. We're in a public hospital. We don't have a lot of substitutions that we can make uh, in, the, in their menus. So that can be uh, part of the problem, but we just saw that patients couldn't, couldn't really keep an oral intake and they would just not eat anything for days and days. And that we know it's uh, harmful for the, the gastrointestinal tract. So even with parental nutrition. So we just started placing a feeding tube before they start transplant because after they get a, a mucositis, so we know that's going to happen any, anyway. So we just place it before they even start conditioning. So when they place the, their long-term catheters uh, for uh, the chemo, uh, we just take advantage of the anesthetics and the, the sedation. They're going to be sleeping and we place the feeding tube as well. And then we start using it when they stop eating and when they start eating again we take them take them out do you do that in your institutions do you use a lot of feeding tubes um we haven't done transplants since it's since covid and then we had no two this year but it's not like yours like many more um so in the old days we did and then now post COVID, it was difficult for me to, to try to convince everybody that we needed tubes. And then the patients went in without the tubes. And then in any case, like you said, in week two, we struggled and we had to put in the tube. Um, so yes, yeah, so I think that just prove, proven to them that we need to go back to the old ways of, of putting, we, we used to put it in like before the transplant, like you said, die minus five or die minus three is when we used to put it in. I mean, that actually worked well because then you can keep it in the whole time. And like you say, 
if they start with a little bit of diarrhea, you can adjust the feeds. Then it's easier to like stop oral, but give this. So yeah, <laughs> that was our struggle this year, but hopefully now I all saw that the tube pasta is the best option. Yeah, mm. I agree. And I, I've tried, I, I've talked to um, dietitians who do transplant in adults and sometimes they, they can maintain a, a, a fair regular oral intake, but for children, I've never seen a child actually eat even a little bit for a, there's like five, seven days where they don't eat anything. And it's really, you, you can't just, yeah. Yeah. No, I, so I, I had a 17 year old as well, but refused the tube. And then at the end, he like baked me for one. <laughs> he said, please, I, I cannot eat anything. And it's, it, it's my throat is sore, my mouth is sore. I can't drink the medicine. So then he like basically asked for one. But yeah, if it was there from the beginning, it could have prevented that discomfort. So, yeah. Is there anybody else want to want to ask something? Hi, thank you, Shaina, for a wonderful presentation. Um, I'm sure this video is going to be watched many times. Um, so thank you for that. I really appreciate your time and the your the way you always do your your lectures is very educational. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you so much for the the invitation. I think it's a very important theme and very specific and really really hard to to deal with. So it's it's nice to have resources to to look for. Yeah. Hey. Okay, thank you so much. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Goodbye.